The information provided is for educational purposes and is not intended to diagnose or treat any conditions. The lifestyle interventions discussed should not be used as a substitute for conventional medical therapy. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Integrative Wellness Radio. I'm here with Nick as he's laughing because I said that my cortisol levels are burnt to a crisp as we get into this topic. <laughs> so uh, Trying to find the balance. It's not always easy. <laughs> it's not always easy. Oh my gosh. So today we are actually talking more about the conversation that we started on our last podcast in relation to melatonin and melatonin playing such a significant role in how well and efficiently our brain detoxifies. But when it comes to melatonin, it plays many, many roles in the body and the brain. And it also works inversely with cortisol. So a lot of this comes back to our sleep and wake cycles. So the reason why we find this to be really important is because melatonin is known for sleep, but it is not well known as being the master detoxifier at, for the brain, but also one of the um, ultimate antioxidants of the entire body. So a lot of people, uh, especially that are familiar with this world, they hear about uh, glutathione and they think glutathione is you know, the best detoxifier of the body. And it is a good detoxifier, but melatonin is actually better. More powerful. More powerful. Yeah. So. Not always better at the right time. <laughs> I will make the disclaimer now is at, please listen to the whole podcast because if you take away a couple tidbits and you go, ooh, melatonin, great detoxifier, and then you go take high doses of it, you will make yourself quite sick. <laughs> so, uh, so really, we want you guys to understand more about melatonin, you know, what it does in the body, how it plays a role in detox, but also how it can be leveraged and used in a really positive way, but definitely um, under the supervision of a physician because there's many things that need to be considered um, when using it. So is there a right time and a wrong time for melatonin? A hundred percent. So first and foremost, uh, just kind of getting into the, the cycles of melatonin, and I'm going to allow Nick to kind of take it a step further, but when we are talking about how melatonin and cortisol work, so cortisol is uh, classified as a stress hormone, but the thing is, is that yes, it can be overproduced in the event that you're stressed or you know, dealing with a lot of things emotionally, but cortisol is actually quite high in the morning, and it's high to wake you up and to make you alert when you're starting your day. And as your day goes on, and obviously the light changes, your cortisol starts to decline and your melatonin starts to go up. And your melatonin will peak you know, in the evening time in order to get you tired enough to get to bed. So that's the normal <laughs> way that it's supposed to work. Obviously, there are many, many people struggling with insomnia and sleep issues, which is really showing us that these pathways can be compromised. So I'll let you talk a little bit more um, about what you mentioned in the last podcast, just in relation to, you know, light and devices and whatnot. So, yeah, there's like you said, there's many things that affect the imbalance of cortisol and melatonin. Um, one of that just being the stress on what we call uh, HPA access, which is the pretty much the connection between your brain to your adrenals because it's your adrenals that make your cortisol. Um, so if that connection is overly taxed uh, or there's miscommunication between uh, that process, then that's going to throw the imbalance of cortisol, which is going to throw the imbalance of melatonin. Um, maybe we'll get a little deeper into that later in the podcast, but for the most part, we want to, you know, first things first, focus on just making sure that your brain can produce the proper amount of melatonin and uh, help you get to sleep and help the brain detox. So there's a couple awesome hacks uh, you can do. You know, we talked about uh, first and foremost in that last podcast, uh, complete darkness. Darkness is going to be the biggest thing. When uh, you're going to sleep. When you're going to sleep, um, even before, uh, because you don't have to be in complete darkness before, but what they found is a lot of times through, you know, whether it's being on, on a computer, or an iPad, and TV, it's really out of those things, um, part of the spectrum of blue light, which is really uh, the strongest negative aspect that affecting the pineal gland, because um, in that, it's really just, it shuts down that production of melatonin altogether. So... 
if somebody has blue light blocking glasses. That's better. Um, it's still not the best because anytime that you are going through, uh, you're stimulating the brain differently with artificial light uh, than natural light. So it's going to be less stress on the pineal gland, but you're still going to be stressing uh, the brain and the pineal gland uh, when you're having those non, um, what do I want to say? more synthetic uh, light coming in, into uh, the brain through the eyes. So speaking of that, I'm actually curious on your thoughts with fluorescent uh, people that work in fluorescent lights all day. It's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's actually a lot more research coming out. Um, I mean, there's they call them full spectrum lights. Uh, it's really a false advertisement because there's really no lights that are full spectrum, uh, but they do give uh, some uh, of the benefits of each spectrum. So the Roy, Roy G. Biv, uh, red, orange, yellow, blue, uh, indigo, violet. Uh, so there's lights out there that will give each property and those wavelengths, but not the entire spectrum of light. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look why that is beneficial, because each spectrum of light uh, getting on a tangent here, but each spectrum of light uh, affects the body differently and it affects different components of the body differently uh, as well, especially when you look at the energetic uh, aspect of the body. Of, like, what, So you're saying the full spectrum lights would be beneficial? Yep. 100%. Oh, okay. Yeah. And these are things that people can see. This is what's funny. We're married and like this is like how different our brains are. But <laughs> No, you can go. So this would be. sell them on Amazon uh, and you can replace um, pretty much the majority of lights. Okay. So when someone is in, say, the fluorescent lights because it's their job and, you know, they're kind of bound to that all day, um, is during, that... During lunch, get outside, yeah. get some sunshine. But this is obviously eating. playing a very significant role in elevating the cortisol and then elevating that to the point that they're probably not going to produce the melatonin efficiently when they're supposed to be going to bed. Yes. Uh, and that's like if you can get outside, that is going to help because it's going to break that up and you're going to be getting the true full spectrum from the sun. Mm -hmm. Also, one of the best things you can do with that is actually grounding. Um, so if you can be barefoot uh, on the ground, you know, grass is best. Um, well, grass is second best. The ocean is literally the best. Um, but with that, that's going to give you that connection So to the earth. Um, why that's so uh, important is the earth resonates at uh, Schumann resonance. It's called 7.8 uh, hertz. And that will also help uh, kind of reset that uh, whole access mm -hmm. uh, as well. And there's some studies, uh, they're doing more research now, um, but that it's actually uh, creating, um, it's increasing the health of the red blood cells, uh, more oxygenation, more hemoglobin, in it, which is pretty cool as well. Mm -hmm. So grounding can uh, be a, an awesome reset, and it's free. Um, I love free cheap things. <laughs> uh, so this little side tangent with all the light aspect, but any light does, I mean, it's going to pretty much stop that. Artificial light. Artificial light uh, is going to stop that melatonin production. So while you're sleeping, have your set your bedroom as like a little sanctuary uh, where you don't have any lights, no night lights, nothing, um, complete darkness. Uh, if you need to get like blackout uh, curtains, um, definitely do that. It's going to be definitely worth the extra little cost. Well, it's just I, like as you're even talking, it's just like thinking about the reality or I would say the reality for most people is that most people are working in, you know, corporate buildings and they're working in offices with artificial light. They're working on computers and other types of devices. You, some people are so busy, you know, in, through their day that they're not even getting outside. They're barely eating a real meal. And then they're getting home and they're so mentally fried that they're probably having a glass of wine and then they're trying to kind of numb themselves by putting on TV so they can forget about their day, let alone if, you know, they got a crappy email or ran into like some type of uh, situation through that day. So if it was one glass of wine and it was French, Italian, somewhere besides, <laughs> that's actually beneficial because one glass will actually create vasodilation, uh, so more blood flow and nutrients to the brain. Mm -hmm. Two glasses or more, the opposite, constriction happens. So uh, that's actually not a bad thing. And it also uh, energetically will ramp up the, uh, the liver, um, so it will actually help the liver produce um, or function better mm -hmm. um, at that. 
a side tidbit. So if you are one of those workers that you can't... So you, you're, you, you just confuse people because... I, <laughs> so let me clarify for Nick. So when you have a glass of wine um, and it has the vasodilation, but what he's talking about with the liver is I know everybody hears about alcohol and they think, you know, obviously alcohol is negative for your liver. But when you um, have that glass of wine and it kind of calms down that fight or flight or sympathetic, you know, stress response, you can actually mobilize like negative energy out of the liver because your liver actually tends to hold on to anger, resentment. So if you had a bad day and you're grabbing for that glass of wine, sometimes it's an intuitive thing for your body to help Only you. One. Only one. <laughs> but I wanted to jump back to that like corporate job or if you're inside underneath a flush lights, you're not getting one of the best things that you can do. Uh, a little hack is, you know, whether it's a tennis ball or something, uh, have that at, at underneath your desk, take your shoes off and roll that around. So underneath on the bottom, like let's say this is your foot, um, if you're listening to this, uh, I guess I'll try to paint a good picture, but underneath your foot on the pretty much like the highest aspect of your arch uh, is your the meridian for your kidney, uh, your K1. So with that, your adrenals sit on top of the kidneys. Um, kidneys in Chinese medicine is your, like your life force. So one of the things you can do is just rub your foot uh, on that ball to stimulate that meridian point. It's going to be like acupressure. Uh, acupuncture is when they're using needles. Acupressure is when you're just applying pressure to it to stimulate the meridian point. Mm -hmm. But that's going to signal more energy flow all the way up to the entire meridian to the kidneys to help support that, even though you, know, you can't be outside and you can't have that grounding all day long. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to know, too, is that when we're talking about melatonin production, um, it's it works top down and um, it works top down and bottom up. So a lot of what we're talking about right now is if your cortisol is really elevated and that be, can be because of stress, it could be because of burnout, it's because you're under these artificial lights all day, that can definitely play a significant role in the lack of melatonin. But then at the same time, your melatonin being produced, uh, so actually I should take this a step back because your melatonin is produced in your pineal gland, but your serotonin actually converts into your melatonin. So having lack of serotonin, especially because you have a lot of gastrointestinal issues, can be a huge part of why you don't have adequate amounts of melatonin. Secondary to that is that if your pineal gland is extremely stressed because of toxicity, which we're going to elaborate on, that can also play a role in your melatonin production. So a lot of people don't always know that serotonin converts into melatonin but that's one of the reasons why uh, the supplement 5-HTP is geared towards sleep problems because 5-HTP converts into serotonin and then that is hopefully going to convert into melatonin. So with that being said is a huge portion of your serotonin is actually made in your gastrointestinal system. So an unmanaged gut issue can very much be an unmanaged brain issue and sleep issue. So that 100% needs to be evaluated. But if you have a sleep problem, uh, a lot of times you're going to a neurologist. If you have a gut problem, you're going to a gastroenterologist. And nobody is talking to each other or necessarily piecing the puzzle together. And that- And sometimes they're, they're both a problem, you know? Exactly. So it's like you'll fix one and like, oh, I still didn't get better, blah, blah, blah. And then you give up, but it's like... Well, I think it's unfortunate how many people are on sleeping pills as well as on antidepressants when it really is, it is an unmanaged gut issue. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, you I'd can... I'd say both because pretty much everybody's pineal gland is not doing well. Well, and that's, that's the next point is, you know, what is going to affect the pineal gland, which again is part of the brain, what would potentially be causing um, the limitation with how melatonin is being produced? And there is a lot of components that can uh, create stress on the pineal gland. And that goes back to almost the last podcast that we did is, you know, is your pineal, get, pineal gland getting proper um, oxygenation because of blood flow? You know, so many people that are struggling with headaches and migraines, it's because they have abnormal blood flow in and out of their head. So that can definitely cause a problem with how much oxygen the pineal gland is getting, which can be a problem for your melatonin. 
But if you want to talk about a stress from a toxicity, one of the biggest known stressors is actually fluoride um, as being negatively impacting the pineal gland. It'll actually calcify uh, the pineal gland. Yeah, so calcify means, you know, calcium is being laid down and it's actually becoming, you know, hard. Yep. Um, so when you're thinking about fluoride, I think a lot of people know fluoride is in the water. And if anything, it's advocated for it to be in the water because it builds strong teeth. Which um, is a lie. <laughs> if, you, if you look at all the research, there is some science showing that topically uh, there's some benefits. There's also a lot of science showing that topically there is no benefits. Um, but pretty much all of the science says that there is no benefits um, taking it uh, orally. Orally, um, yeah. And there's a lot of, all the science pretty much says that it's it's a neurotoxin. So if you take it orally, uh, it's gonna get into your nervous system. And the unfortunately, it's your pineal gland has the, the big net, biggest magnet uh, for fluoride. Well, and two, it's like with the amount of fluoride we're all exposed to, it's, it's more than we would ever need for strong teeth. And um, I said this in the last podcast as well, but one of the things that I literally learned three weeks ago is that all of the white dental fillings that go into cavities, uh, I shouldn't say all, but if you're going to a traditional dentist that is not classified as a holistic or biological dentist, uh, those fillings are actually time-releasing fluoride throughout the amount of time they're in your mouth. So you're having a time-released fluoride from your fillings, then you're also getting your fluoride treatments with your cleanings, and then in addition to that, it's in the water, it's also in many vitamins, um, and other types of beverages, like Pellegrino, as an example, has fluoride in it. Well, some, I mean, there is a difference between not that there's it's structured differently, um, but there is natural fluoride, and then there's synthetic man-made fluoride. Yes. And they, they're both not the best for you, but definitely the synthetic's processed a lot stronger. Yeah. So the fluoride exposure is definitely, we're all being exposed to it. And if you have lived in an area where there is a high amount in the water, or if you've been given, um, especially as a child, if you actually grew up in an area they didn't have the fluorinated water, then chances are you were given uh, fluoride drops or you were giving, uh, given fluoridated uh, vitamins. So that is actually even more potent than what is available in the water. So these are all things that play a very significant role in the melatonin production. So depending on what the issue is, you know, obviously you have to consider all of your environmental factors like Dr. Nick mentioned is, you know, are you going to bed with a device, you know, in front of your face, watching TV, et cetera? Are you constantly under artificial light? Do you even have artificial light in your bedroom? And then, you know, what's going on that could be affecting your neurological system and what can you do to actually improve it? Do you want me to talk about that or? You go for it, my friend. Well, I mean, honestly, when you look at the nervous system uh, and the brain, everything's processed through it. So it's like, you know, are you, are you walking around? Are you physical? You know, that's the best nutrient for your brain is, you know, movement. Uh, that's my favorite way to hack the brain uh, neurologically is through specific body movements to activate different parts of the brain. Even different eye movements is going to activate different parts of the brain. So I love, uh, I love moving. Uh, moving is one of the best things you can do. Um, then you're looking at the other things that we talked about, you know, chemical, that's going to stress the brain. Um, emotional, uh, if you're a very highly emotional, highly reactional, highly judge, judging person, that's going to create a lot of overstimulation throughout the limbic system, uh, which is literally the pineal glands the right, neighbor. right right, in the middle of it all. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty much, yeah, it's dead smack in the middle because on both sides, well, go into anatomy right now. <laughs> but um, it's it's going to be affected by that. But it's also not just through the brain, but it's like all those emotions. You know, we talk about adrenal burnout. Uh, and if you're just like on stress all the time, uh, that will go through and increase the cortisol, which is going to lower your melatonin. So making sure that you have uh, a balanced uh perception, balanced emotion, uh, you're not too high, you're not too low, uh, that you're just, you know, you're seeing, you're having a good conscious awareness of what's really happening around you. Uh, and then energetically, you know, there's tons of meridians uh, that go over the head and innervate different areas. And then when you look at even deeper, uh, the different chakras, um, so you have, you know, your sixth and seventh chakra that right there in your six is literally dead on to the pineal gland. 
uh, and then your seventh your crown going up so it's like those are two major important areas energetically uh, that you want to make sure it's like a lot of times you'll be doing all this neurological work uh, but then you'll plateau and what we've what I found uh, working on people is a lot of times it's what they haven't been evaluated for evaluated for and what they've never had any treatment for which is their energetic system and i think that that's a big thing is like some of you listening might be like oh that's super weird and woo woo but um i've found you know for myself i've always been super analytical and i was always about blood work and labs and i had my own personal experience with hitting a plat a major plateau and found out that a big part of my issue was energetic and emotional and um, mine all stemmed from my liver, but when you're coming back to the pineal gland and the chakra associated with it, um, I find that with a lot of my patients, um, that can be blocked in the event, uh, because this is classified as your third eye, is um, what do they not wanna see? And there's a lot of things that we go through in our lives, and if you are maybe in a bad relationship or you know that your spouse cheated on you or, or certain things is, you can or you almost wake up every day and you hate going to work. Yeah, you, know? you can easily block that chakra because you're almost like, I just need to power through. I just need to keep going. You know, I just this is my reality right now. Like, it's not time. I can't leave him or I can't do this or I can't leave the job. I need the security. And that's increased stress, which goes down, affects the adrenals, which affects the cortisol. Yeah. So I think it's just that system is it's a system there is energy channels in our body the same as there is blood flow and everything else so it's very important that that is considered when I mean, it's been around just about 2000 plus years so yeah. I, I think it's uh, well and even in this holistic medicine world all you know we talk about how uh, traditional medicine and conventional medicine is so segregated you know your cardiologist gastroenterologist neurologist but the same thing is really happening in the world of holistic medicine as well mm-hmm. you know you have your acupuncturist which is dealing with those energy systems and then you have your functional medicine doctors and then you have your massage therapists and your personal trainers and everything else so we have just found that we hit plateaus <clears throat> excuse me, with our patients over time, and that's what kept us learning and putting everything under one roof, essentially. So it's definitely been an amazing evolution to understand all of those pieces and be able to help people in a really significant way. Um, But one of the things I do want to say, like going back to the melatonin, is that many people take melatonin. And there's some people that take it and they do well. They're like, oh, it helped me sleep. It's like the best thing ever. And then there's other people that take it and it makes them feel bad. It keeps them awake. It gives them bad dreams. So would you like to elaborate further? I would love to. Um, I was just so to let's start with- Trying to figure out where, where to start with that. I'd say with starting, if you take it and you have that negative reaction, um, you have two choices. You can A, power through it, um, or don't, because if well, you do have that, it's because your brain's detoxing. So you're having a reaction to your brain actually going through that detox process, and really the reaction is that it's not detoxing properly. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it's not detoxing properly, that creates more inflammation, and then you're going to have either really bad sleep, no, no sleep, or some really crazy dreams because uh, it's messing with all that information. Well, like you said before, talk about balance. So back in the day um, I guess it's like almost 10 years ago now uh, when we first started practicing which we obviously didn't know then what we know now um, do you remember how we would so we would drive home but we had one car so we drove together and we only drove maybe 15 minutes to get home and I would get into the car and pass out so hard that I would be dreaming and Nick would have to like shake me to wake me up. Sometimes I would mess with her and I would just like go in the house and (laughs) leave her in the car. (laughs) But I'm telling this story because I thought that was normal. Like I thought it was great. I was like, I'm a great sleeper. I could sleep anywhere. And then I ended up uh, doing neurological testing and I did a neurotransmitter test which tested melatonin. And I remember my melatonin was through the roof. And I remember being confused about it. And I was like, what is this? What does this mean? Like, this is really bizarre. And I was like, well, clearly this is why I'm sleeping the way that I am. And, you know, maybe having like a low grade narcolepsy, essentially. (laughs) And uh, 
But then later down the line, you know, learning so much about the neurological system, what I realized is my body naturally was amping up my melatonin production in order to try to detox my neurological system. And it was because other testing that I did actually revealed I had very, very significant mercury toxicity. So that, you know, obviously it's very difficult to test. Is it actually in my brain? or affecting my brain, but it clearly was. So my body being smart, you know, intuitive, intuitively was like, let's raise the melatonin to try to detox our neurological system. But then obviously it was creating, you know, this side effect of being able to sleep anywhere and, you know, to kind of fall in that deep sleep, which I clearly thought was a great thing. And then when my body like started to get better and correct, I was like, oh, so I guess that wasn't really that normal. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> yeah. So it's definitely interesting across the board of what it looks like when your brain is dealing with toxicity and how the melatonin can affect you. So for Nick and I, um, we have actually embarked. Can I talk some more about the orally first? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. So when you're taking it, so if you don't get a bad reaction, it actually helps you sleep. Uh, a, awesome. Uh, it's going to help you sleep, but you don't want to be dependent on it because anytime mm -hmm. you do take something for a long time, it weakens the actual structure in the system mm -hmm. to do it itself. So melatonin is not something you want to do a long time at all. And what I've found clinically getting uh, better results is actually almost like microdosing with it because you're really just you're giving the body a little taste and say, hey, here I am, mm -hmm. produce more. So it's actually you're giving the body a, a good, a little bit of support, but also a little bit of a challenge to naturally produce more melatonin wouldn't, itself. Like, wouldn't you say this microdosing concept, though, is better for a person who maybe they suffered with a pretty significant gastrointestinal issue, which compromised their serotonin, and maybe they've worked on their gut and now they're trying to correct their melatonin? The microdosing would be good. If yeah, if they've corrected it, because I mean, most, honest to God, most people that take it it's barely going to get to their brain because their yeah. stomach's not functioning properly. Yeah, because when it comes to the the you know the other side of it, if you're resonating with the symptoms of brain toxicity, like that's kind of a completely different ball game of of how to work with the system. Right. And then I mean and then literally orally is probably my least favorite way of taking melatonin anyways. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a lot more uh intelligent ways to take it so it affects the body uh it's struggling for how much i want to say on the podcast because i don't <laughs> want somebody just run out and like google and purchase some things and then have some really bad side effects um but just looking at the science of the body uh the two best ways to actually take melatonin is transdermal so you're putting it on your skin letting it soak in um, or rectally uh so doing it as a suppository so i would Unless you've done your due diligence and you've done a lot of work and you're working with somebody that knows what they're doing, absolutely do not do a suppository because uh, that's really strong and really powerful. Yeah. Uh, because it goes in and it goes right to your there's, like doesn't have to go through the stomach, doesn't have to be digested. It's going to go right in your bloodstream, yeah. and that's really strong and it can create a lot of problems if you're not doing all the other. Um, detoxing benefits with it, uh, you literally have to support every system or you're not going to be a happy camper. Well, that was the conversation that we had as we've gone through our own personal melatonin detox. And uh, we said, you know, we had s definitely some side effects, but, you know, we said we really can't recommend this to people that have not done any type of work on themselves in the past because it's not where you want to start. Yeah, we've <laughs> been on a health journey for, you know, eight, nine years now and, you know, we still had to be really, really strategic for ourselves. Because when we started with the transdermal high dose melatonin and that created um, some really interesting symptoms. Uh, it was almost like an emotional detox uh, for myself, at least. But um, the first time that I did the um, the melatonin suppository, you, if you remember, I didn't sleep for, and I didn't, I don't even think I sleep slept at all that night. I felt like I drank seventy five cups of coffee, and um, it was like a serious 
general nervous system detox. And then Nick just looks at me and he's like, your nervous system sucks. <laughs> I'm like, Good thank morning. you. Thank you for that. <laughs> so so considering how much, you know, work I've done on myself, infrared saunas, foot baths, you know, supplements, detoxes, et cetera. You know, this was still, uh, you know, creating definitely some some side effects in my system. You know, obviously, there the benefits are huge once you get past the you know the difficult part. But um, you know, the point of this podcast is to have you guys really understand. Like, if you have been a person struggling with your sleep, and you've you know been struggling with burnout, and you've really you started to take melatonin, now it stopped working, and you've been on Ambien, and you've been on you know all of these different protocols to correct your sleep. Like, this is something to bring to your awareness that you could be dealing with a massive melatonin issue because of toxicity in the brain, and there are amazing protocols out there but you definitely need to work with a physician in order to make sure you're doing it correctly because when we're talking about high dose melatonin you know melatonin when people take it orally is a milligram two milligrams like three at at max we're talking 200 to 400 milligrams like it is a completely different ball game when we're we're doing that level so um so this is definitely something that has extreme benefit but you might need to support your gut going through the process. You might need to do lymphatic detox going through the process. You might need to be taking other supplements that are complementing the the detox. There's a lot of strategy that goes into it. Yes, lots of strategy. <laughs> so for those of you that are really resonating with this podcast and are you're like, wow, this really sounds like me and I've been struggling with my sleep for a really long time and I really feel like I'm scared for my neurological system and you know, I do feel very foggy, especially you know, being young and I'm nervous about having more significant neurological decline, you know, hop on a strategy call with our client care team and learn a little bit more about the testing that we do um, because we always do testing to dictate, are you even a candidate for the melatonin detox? Because, you know, everybody starts somewhere and you might not be a candidate for it right away, um, but you might be, ha- be able to do other preliminary things to start correcting these pathways as well. And it's not just, it, I, we, I mean, we've both seen awesome results with it and the more severe aspect of neurological disorders too, you mm-hmm. know, because sometimes you got to bring out the big guns for those to really cross that threshold uh, mm-hmm. to be able to kind of get them back in, you know, the game, uh, needless to say. So it 100%. can be utilized in so many different ways when done correctly. A hundred percent. Well, we thank you guys for being with us, and we're going to be hopping on and doing another podcast, and it's we're still staying on the neurological theme, but we're going to be talking all about migraines, and one of the biggest reasons why people have migraines, um, and especially cannot always manage them through traditional medications. So join us on our next podcast, and we'll see you guys soon.